So I'm going to talk a little bit today about smart cities and um, just go straight to the punchline. I'm going to talk about the sort of smart cities that we could have and some of the smart cities that we may have if we're not, if we're not careful. <laughs> now, many people's view of a smart city, you might, have a, you might have read about it in the press, you might have read in your, in your newspaper what a smart city is, what, what we can hope from them, and many people have this very optimistic view of smart cities, that somehow technology is going to enable us to be able to use our infrastructure at 100% capacity. So I've got a little, little video that you may have seen, because like everybody else, I've borrowed it off Google. It's probably referenced, obviously, because I'm an academic. Um, so this is the view that many people have of, of smart cities, and I apologise in advance that you'll be singing this song for the next three hours. <laughs> So this is this idea that with perfect information and perfect data and perfect communications, we can somehow optimise systems perfectly. So everything works smoothly together and we can, have, we can fill our roads with as much traffic as we want because they're all being managed and everything works smoothly together. And that's the sort of utopian dream of, of smart cities. And it's mostly nonsense. The other thing you'll have noticed about smart cities is everyone's a smart city. So I did a little bit of uh, Google searching on the, term, on the term smart city, and this is, this is Hulls uh, announced last month that they're working with um, Cisco and connecting to big companies to develop a smart city system, city system for Hull. Not just Hull, mind, Birmingham, they're at it as well. They're developing smart city systems as part of their uh, digitization and, and digital revolution. <coughs> this one's Amsterdam, although, so we're not, we're not just limited to the, to the UK. Amsterdam is regularly voted the world's <coughs> smartest city. Uh, and Amsterdam does a lot of things around, around smart. <coughs> this is Bristol. Bristol, until last year, was the UK's smartest city. I'll just leave you in suspense as to which city is currently the UK's <laughs> smartest city. But well, Bristol has had this reputation of, uh, of being very smart through there. Bristol is open platform, a technology platform. There's that word again. A technology platform that they can build smart systems off. <clears throat> Perhaps it's a lesson to us all that uh, Bristol is open technology platform is currently used by exactly zero people to do anything meaningful. <laughs> and this is Mac Milton Keynes. They've been, they've been one of the smart pioneers. This was perhaps my favorite result of the Google search because you might have seen that they've stopped being smart as of June 2017 when they ran out of money for being smart. Again, another lesson to us all. Let's make sure we can keep these things Funded, we have to think about the value that we extract from data and into information and somehow translate that to make sure projects happen. <laughs> and of course, we're here in Newcastle, Smart City of the Year 2019, and a well deserved accolade uh, <coughs> about the work being done not only here at the university, but at the city council and with many other stakeholders about 
trying to develop a, a, a system. So there's all of these cities, and pretty much every single city out there is trying to be smart. So what do we, what do we mean by smart? Oh, I forgot this slice. So we're, this is Maggie Philby, one for the kids, for giving us our accolade uh, earlier this year for Smart City of the Year. <coughs> So one of these views of smart cities is that what we can do with all of these different systems is through technology, through digital, through computers, through apps, through data and databases and connecting these all together, we can miraculously improve our cities. So we can streamline operations. We can streamline the transactions. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I'm old enough to remember when we had a really streamlined way of paying for parking. And that streamlined way was you walked around with a pocket full of coins, and they were universal, and they fitted anywhere in any of the parking meters, and off you went. And now we have a, a streamlined system where I can pay by app, provided I've downloaded the right app, and different cities will have a different app, or I can pay by my card under certain circumstances, and I provide lots of information. <coughs> so there's this idea that digital streamlines all of these things. One of the issues about cities is all of these systems, though, are interconnected. If we look at these things in isolation, if we try and think of these as, as vertical systems that we're trying to improve, we're going to run into trouble because we might improve one system and by doing so we impact other systems. So it's much better if we start thinking about how we integrate some of these vertical systems together whether that's healthcare or energy or retail or security, how we start to integrate these. <coughs> so you can think about a city as well as all of these different systems trying to talk to each other, trying to communicate with each other. And this is often sold as a done deal. All we need to do is spend a lot of money and build these systems and off we go. And actually it's incredibly hard to think about how all of these systems will communicate. Who's going to manage the infrastructure of communication? How do one set of systems talk to another? Particularly hard when you take people out of the loop. And all of these systems are expected to be handled automatically, through computer to computer communication that happens seamlessly and hopefully without faults. And that's a really big ask, I think, of our current state of technology, that we can somehow combine all of this. We certainly work towards it. We think about how we describe different systems. We can describe them in ways that computers can understand. But actually reasoning across many different complex interactions, whether you're talking about smart systems in our home, smart transport, smart buildings, and communicating meaningful information between them, technically, is really very difficult. <laughs> There's another view of, of smart cities, and, and um, it's, it's perhaps more prevalent in, in the Far East than it is um, in Europe, and smart cities being about communications. So there's a, there's a tacit assumption within the sort of smart cities movement that if you connect everything up through one of these technologies, then somehow you'll miraculous be, miraculously be smart. <coughs> Now, obviously I'm of a certain age and I remember the days before mobile phones. I also remember the days before the internet was not even a thing. There's some, there's some interesting evidence that 
our, our fixation with mobile phones and apps and social media is making us less able to think. So somehow connecting us all up so we're always on and connected to the internet through 4G or Wi-Fi is actually making us less able to process information. So how we think connecting everything up in a city is miraculously going to solve uh, our problems and just smart will fall out of communications is again, I think, a bit of a pipe dream. <laughs> and of course, this is a pipe dream that's being pushed very heavily. Some of the biggest companies out there base their business model on building infrastructure against through which we transmit data. So many of you will have seen 5G being mentioned. So I don't know about you, but I haven't had a requirement yet where I really want to download eight movies simultaneously while wandering around the streets, which is the sort of promise of 5G. And it's sort of that, well, what's, it's being pushed because people are, in order to pay for it, it costs an enormous amount to invest. And the benefits of it, hopefully, they hope, will fall out of it. But that's not a natural connection that's just going to happen. <laughs> and a note of caution. Cities, um, I was going to ask this one way, I'm going to ask it the other way. Put your hands up if you've never had a problem connecting to your wireless printer. <laughs> There's one hand at the back. And I'm going to suggest they don't have a wireless printer. <laughs> a wireless printer uses Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, both technologies that have been around now for a decade or more, to connect things. And we're only connecting two devices. And that's pretty hard work normally. There are quite a lot of swearing goes on whenever you have to print out a document. It certainly does in our house. <coughs> so thinking that even if we put in these communication networks, are they going to work seamlessly or not? Um, the picture on your right is actually from last year's Christmas market. And uh, we have a similar one this year. It's even bigger, Newcastle's Christmas market. I'll come back to the Christmas market later. Uh, this year, this is 2018 Christmas market. And the reason I've got a picture of the Helter Skelter there is one of the things that we do in the city is we measure lots of things. And um, this Helter Skelter all and by itself managed to remove about 70% of our data traffic because it was a bit high. <laughs> so the microwave link that sends the data, it also sends some of the city's CCTV, but don't tell anyone that. Um, <coughs> that microwave link went out because the Helter Skelter broke that connection. So we lost data for a number of days um, and it also would have been quite good had you been a pickpocket in Newcastle because there was very little CCTV around for a little while until we fixed it. The point is, working in cities, these are real places and real things happen and they're very complex systems. We can't rely on ubiquitous communications even if we have 5G and Wi-Fi and 4G. All of this stuff around smart cities is built on a few fundamental building blocks. One of which is called uh, the Internet of Things, you may have heard the term. Um, and this describes devices that are embedded in our systems that are transmitting data to, to the internet somewhere, often about the state of themselves. Traffic lights have uh, Internet of Things sensors that connect to the internet. Uh, CCTV cameras connect to the internet. We put out a lot of uh, environmental monitoring kit. So you might think that some of the most sought after real estate in Newcastle is perhaps a, a lovely Georgian street in Gosford. No, 
these lampposts at the end of Northumberland Street. So our, our one lamppost here, I counted 14 devices on it. Uh, some of which I know what they do, some of which I have absolutely no idea what they do at all. So we build these systems on the Internet of Things. And this is becoming extraordinarily prevalent. There are very little system goes out these days that doesn't have embedded systems and sensors that transmit data back somewhere. <coughs> so the volumes, the data we get, is often described as big data. <coughs> and big data is typified by what we call the five Vs. So the first V is about volume. There's a huge amount of it. An absolutely extraordinarily large amount of data is being generated all of the time. It's being generated by you. Your phone is collecting information and generating it. It's being generated by our systems. It's being generated by our infrastructure. So enormous volumes of data. It comes very quickly. So the second V is velocity. It arrives very quickly. We're transmitting this data at very high signal rates. In some cases, this is millisecond by millisecond data. So very high velocity data that we have to deal with. And we get it in lots of different forms. So it's not just one type of data. We can measure all sorts of things. We might send status updates. We send images. We send videos. So big data is typified by variety, the variety of things that we record. The extra two Vs that we've added over the last couple of years are about veracity, about how good our data is. And the one I think that is the most important is about the value of data. How do we extract value and how do we measure the value of that data? If we don't measure the value of data, how can we have sustainable systems and invest and keep on investing in those things? <coughs> now, you should never do a live demo, so I'm going to do a live demo. And if it doesn't work, I apologise in advance. But just to give you an idea of, of some of these systems, so what you're seeing here is the live stream of data being recorded from one building in the university. So this is our urban sciences building over by St. James's. And this is throwing out somewhere in the region of 100 pieces of information every single second of every single day. And this is one building. The university is made up of several hundred buildings, all of which are pumping out this type of data. So we deal with extraordinary, extraordinary volumes of data. So how do we deal with all of this enormous amount of data? What's the, how do we manage that data? Well, one of the ways that is, is very topical and very fashionable at the moment is something we call artificial intelligence, although it's not really intelligent, or machine learning, where we train computers to make decisions on data. And this works where we don't have, where we have so much data, you can't possibly have a human analyzing it all. Or the data comes so quickly that we can't analyze it quick enough. In which case, if we want to make sense of that, we have to put a computer in the middle and use machine learning and other techniques in order to analyze that data. One of the applications of machine learning is around um, video and CCTV. You can train a computer to recognize different aspects of a video. Um, this is a CCTV camera, as you can see, pointing down Northumberland Street. And what this algorithm has been trained to do is count heads. So it counts heads moving in different directions. 
The video here is really for illustrative purposes to show what's happening underneath. So what we get here are counts of the people who cross all of those blue lines in several directions. <coughs> and this goes on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Day and night, counting, constantly counting. And that's the benefit. You couldn't possibly employ a person to do the same. And they certainly wouldn't be able to do, do that when there was crowds as there are today wandering up and down Northumberland Street. At max during the European Rugby Cup finals that were a few months back in Newcastle, we were recording 4,000 people walking up and down Northumberland Street every five minutes. So computers can deal with this volume of data. <coughs> and just in case you're uh, worried about computers taking over the world, then um, just look at the left-hand side of this picture, where uh, you might recognize David Beckham there. And you can train an algorithm till you're blue in the face, but it will never quite be as good as a person, because it's it's constantly recognising David Beckham there as a, pick, as a head. Well, I suppose he is in a way. It's not counting, it's not messing up our statistics because he doesn't ever cross the blue lines. So it's only if he crosses the blue lines that it... This is an example of how we use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to sit in between our data so that we can extract value and information. But actually, it's a bit creepy. Some of this, I think, and I do it, it's a bit creepy. We work very hard here. It's really key that you understand something like pedestrian movement to understand the city. We already do a lot of car counting. That's been going on for years. If we don't count pedestrians, we'll end up just designing cities that work for cars and not pedestrians. So I think it's pretty critical that we measure things like pedestrian movement, so we understand how pedestrians are impacted by the decisions we make, whether we put in bus lanes, or we pedestrianise, or we build new intersections. It's critical for cities that we understand the impact on pedestrians. But in order to do so, we have to measure it. What we do here is we use a technique called edge computing, and edge computing puts the processing close to the sensor, or on the sensor, or in the sensor. So we train an algorithm to go and do counting, and then that algorithm runs on the sensor to do that counting. What gets transmitted back then is completely depersonalized information. So no video. What we actually get typically from these systems is we get a count every five minutes. So we get 400 people uh, walked in a northerly direction across this point in the last five minutes. So you try and depersonalize that data. But I think it's something we should be really concerned about as citizens. You may have seen the uh, press around uh, King's Cross and facial recognition and a number of our large supermarkets doing facial recognition. With good lighting and a good camera, it's pretty straightforward to do. In fact, you can set up your own facial recognition software on your laptop with a, a download of a few bits, a few tools and a few bits of software. Technically, it's quite easy to do. Morally, it should be quite hard to do. And we've always got to play this balance around these sorts of techniques, around the value of the data, because it undoubtedly has value in it. And if we're trying to design cities for the public good, we need that data against how it could be used. And we need to be very careful that we don't hand over these to the wrong people. <coughs> you may have seen some things going on in Toronto. So Toronto, have, uh, on the riverside in Toronto, uh, a large tract of land there the, the, the city authority has got into uh, a partnership with a group called Sidewalk Labs. Sidewalk Labs are owned by Alphabet. Alphabet is what we used to call Google. 
but they changed their name once Google started getting a little bit of a bad rep. So they've been developed this thing around Toronto and developing it. And again, it's about how we present what we do with data and who owns the data is a real interesting question about smart cities. So the Sidewalk Lab project has run into enormous problems because it's Google behind it pushing all of these systems. <laughs> so they're trying to build from the internet up, this uh, utopian smart city. And there's been an enormous amount of pushback from the residents of Toronto, particularly the people who live in that area, who see this as just this idea that they're trying to turn their neighborhood where they live into somewhere where Google can extract profit from data. So we need to be very careful when we're talking around smart cities and we're thinking about smart cities, that you do this bringing the citizens and people along with you. <coughs> this is the, uh, according to Wikipedia, that well-known source of true fact, particularly for academics. Uh, this is the uh, capitalization of the world's largest companies. And I think it's interesting because 2015, there is, I suppose, what you would call one technology company in there. We've got Microsoft near the bottom. Come 2019, our top biggest market capitalization firms, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Alphabet, technology companies, actually data companies. They're all data companies. <coughs> That's a big shift in a very small amount of time around the value of these companies. <coughs> um, this is, I don't know if you ever use this, this is Google, just, just as an illustration of the sorts of data they are already collecting, these data companies. This is my Google timeline, which if you go and do your own Google timeline, if you happen to have an Android phone, then this is everywhere I've visited in the last five years, just captured automatically. And Google say, I'm the only one who can see it, um, apart from them, obviously, and apart from the time at which they can start to make a, a profit from it and sell it to someone else, I imagine. But there's enormous amounts of data being collected out there. <coughs> so. What, what could a smart city look like? There are undoubtedly issues and problems that, and challenges around smart city, technical ones, social ones. So the sort of vision that we've been having here in Newcastle about smart cities borrows heavily from this idea of using data. And we take, we took our, our we took the idea of astronomical observatories Astronomical observatories have been collecting data for years, pointing telescopes at the stars, carefully noting things, making, collecting information, constantly collecting information, getting long baselines of data. <coughs> and it's through data, I believe, that we can start potentially to realise some of the benefits that are being espoused around smart cities. Using data as evidence for change, using data so that we can uh, understand the impacts of decisions that we make. <coughs> now we're talking about cities, but actually this phenomena of rapid growth in data driving huge new scientific understanding comes across in many different disciplines. So this is the discovery of exoplanets or planets outside of the solar system. And we can see in 1989, we discovered our first one and then very, very slow, discovered a few extra. And then suddenly there's this technological shift, this change of gear. 
And we see this rapid rise in discovery. And with that rapid rise in data, we get an understanding, theory improves, methods improve, our understanding of how these systems work improve. You see the same shape, the same curve, the same rise as you get enormous amounts of data, as your data reaches a critical level. You get that elbow point where suddenly it's shifting up. This is the sequence genomes, these are plant genomes, and we see the same curve in terms of, terms of data. <laughs> and I think we're starting to see that now in terms of, in terms of cities, this is um, our data holdings as of March 2019. It's not quite steep enough yet, but we're starting to see that rise in data. So when I talk about data, what do I, what do I mean about data? Well, this is a, a video from the 2012 to monsoon that some of you may remember completely drew Newcastle to an absolute standstill. And what it shows is, as well as serious flooding on the quayside, what it shows and what that event showed is how all of these systems are interconnected. So we have a perfectly natural system that we can't control, rainfall, we certainly can't control in the short term. That impacted transport systems, we couldn't drive. That impacts power systems, the electricity went down, so the metro went down. The station stopped working, everything ground to a halt. We couldn't even use our cell phones because the power went down to the cell bats and the, and the towers. We couldn't even tell our friends and family that we were going to be four hours late getting home from work. All of these systems are interconnected. <laughs> Jane Jacobs, who's a, a US planner, wrote in the 60s, she wrote, that you could think of cities as these immense laboratories where we're constantly trying things out. And this is, a, this is the sort of vision that we have for what we're trying to do here in Newcastle, is think of the city as a laboratory where we can understand experiments and learn from them in order to do it better next time. So what have we been doing? Well, what we've been doing in Newcastle is we've built the UK's, Europe's, maybe the world's, I don't know, largest environmental monitoring network. So actually, I shouldn't use the word monitoring, because monitoring has that connotation, if you're of a certain age, it has that connotation of milk monitors, somebody making sure you drink your slightly warm quarter pint of milk before you can sit down. I should call them observations, because observations is about learning. So we have the world's, UK's, Europe's largest observation network for environmental systems. About a billion and a half, a few more, data points, and about 5,000 added every single minute of every single day. That equates to about 3,600 individual streams of data constantly pouring in about the city. <coughs> Things like air pollution. Newcastle has the largest and densest network of air pollution monitoring anywhere in the country. Not just per capita, absolute volume. <coughs> So we have more sensors and systems than London. We have this very large network to try and understand that. But all of these systems connect together, so we have to measure over many different systems. In fact, we measure across 64 different variables here in Newcastle, from urban beehives to the sewage pumping through pipes to air quality to traffic to pedestrian movement to try and understand how all of these systems interact uh, together. The bottom one of the two bishops, by the way, is not measuring whether you're Catholic, Protestant or atheist, it's wind, because wind's invisible. 
so some of these things are invisible. It's hard to measure. It's hard to hard to hard to see things like air quality and uh, and wind. So that's my representation of wind. Just in case you were wondering. <laughs> There are experiments going on in cities all of the time. So this is Blackett Street taken last summer. Um, one of the great initiatives we had here in Newcastle, many of you remember, was we pedestrianised, I say we, we collectively, I had very little to do with it, we pedestrianised Blackett Street and turned it into a destination. We had uh, grass, official grass and seats and all of these things. So we can think about how, we, how do we understand the impact of that? How do we measure it? How do we measure the impact of that sort of thing in terms of air quality, in terms of traffic, in terms of pedestrian movement? How do we understand the value of that decision that we've made? Did it improve things the way we wanted it to? Did it have unforeseen consequences that we weren't aware of until we look at the data and analyze that data? If you don't collect data across all those different variables, how are you supposed to answer those sorts of questions? And I think it's many of the problems facing cities today, air quality, carbon net zero, climate change, there's a meeting next door about climate change going on as we speak. So apologies if you walked into the wrong lecture theatre and you're expecting something on climate change. That's next door. These are what we call wicked problems. These sorts of problems, they're wicked problems. And by wicked, I mean there's no simple solution to them. There's no quick fix. In order to solve them, somebody loses. The question is, who loses and for how long? We can solve the air quality problem in Newcastle tomorrow by banning all traffic into the city centre. The city centre will then not have an air quality problem. It's a very simple solution. But we, people will pay for that. Possibly that's the shops who close down because there's less people. Possibly it's the people where those cars now go and they take the side streets and go, go to the city centre. And they're the ones that suffer. All of these wicked problems are typified by the fact they are trade-offs. And we have to understand the trade-offs to make decisions. And perhaps more importantly, we have to make sure our decision makers have enough evidence so that they can make those really hard decisions. And they are not completely swayed by who shouts loudest. As you well know, Newcastle uh, City Centre, Newcastle City Centre is one of 29 cities in the UK who has to do something about NO2, nitrogen dioxide pollution. In terms of experiment, we've been monitoring the city for three years. So we know what it was beforehand. When the consultation finishes on Monday and a plan is implemented, we will be able to measure its impact. We will be able to say, has it improved air quality? Hopefully it will reduce NO2. But has it made another metric? PM 2.5, which is particulate matter that many people think has worse health implications than NO2. Has it moved the problem? We fix it for the Tyne Bridge and we fix it for the Central Motorway, but we've just moved the problem elsewhere. Through monitoring at scale, we hopefully can answer those questions. And this is what we think of around experiments in the city and the city as a lab. <laughs> the thing about data, though, is data alone is not enough. What you see here is uh, some data from a network of noise sensors. Um, I'll use the word noise rather than sound, and you'll understand why in a minute. Uh, so this is uh, noise sensors that are scattered around the city, and they return a value of the noise that they measure uh, every minute back into, back into our systems. And you can see here there's a signal, a repeating signal happens at the same time every night for these three nights. If you just have data, that is all you have to go on. I see a pattern, I see a signal, but we don't know what it is. 
We don't know what caused it. And if we don't know what caused it, how can we fix it? So data on its own, whilst it's interesting, doesn't tell us a great deal. What we need is some context to that data. <laughs> so one of the ways we accrue context is we use the network of CCTV cameras around the city. And they take a low resolution still image every 10 minutes, which is in the public domain. And anyone can go and have a look at that. And we store those images against the measurements so that we can start to provide some context to the way the measurements were taken. It's currently about 100 million of these images uh, that we've now stored. This event, some of you might have been there, and the reason why I called it noise was it was uh, Ed Sheeran's concert <laughs> on um, three consecutive nights uh, a year or so back, and that was his, uh, that was his encore on those three consecutive nights being picked, picked up. So I think I'm right calling it a noise sensor. <laughs> <coughs> but I don't want you to go away thinking, well, that's great, we just got all this data. Because data is, is really hard to deal with. And particularly when you start thinking about the Internet of Things, because these are devices that are quite small, uh, relatively cheap, and therefore we have an issue around data quality. So we have to think of new ways of managing our data, dealing with precision and accuracy. We don't have perfect data. So how do we make decisions occasionally when some of our data is imperfect? <laughs> uh, one of my colleagues who's not here, so I can say things about him, because I know he's in a different country. So he spent quite a long time saying how bad the uh, air quality was uh, on the side of the Gateshead side of the Tyne Bridge in all of his visualization talks. Um, and actually, what he was reporting was three faulty sensors that were reporting uh, error values constantly. We need to manage all of this data. And again, we can use machine learning to try and pick out the, the signal from the noise when we have issues with our, with our data. Here we can see a sensor that's recording information, but it's recording information. The shape's correct, but the offset is incorrect. <coughs> and of course, we have to, a lot of this is top down, but if you don't involve and bring the citizens along, if you don't involve people, then how do they, how, how can we build a, build a system that they trust? So one of the things that we do is we publish all of our data, all of the city's data. In fact, anybody who will give us data, we publish it all in an easy to use platform. We also provide kits to communities so they can go and monitor their own thing to generate evidence for what matters to them locally. We can't put equipment everywhere. It costs quite a lot of money. So we have to choose. So one of the things we do is we loan out scientific grade communities through a project called Sense My Street, where people can go and monitor their own traffic, noise, and, and air quality. And critically, we use scientific grade instruments, not very cheap things, so that that data means something. They can use it as an evidence base. <coughs> The other thing we need to think about around smart cities, and the smart that's often forgotten, <coughs> is the people and process bit of smart. Every tiny decision you make in a city sits on top of an iceberg of governance, regulation, processes, overlapping jurisdictions. <coughs> uh, this humble lamp post on uh, the Helix site, Science Central, uh, the, the sort of second university campus along there, one of the things I wanted to do was put a sensor on it, which required power from the lamppost. And just as an example of, of the problems that entailed, in order to get permission to do it, that's, I had to go through three committees, nine meetings, eight site visits, had five engineers, sent 327 emails, made 42 telephone conversations, involved, involved 45 people. That's to fit one sensor to one lamppost. 
We've got a lot better now. We're much more streamlined and, and, and have some of these processes. But every single decision you make currently in cities sits on top of this enormous governance, regulation, and uh, economic system that we also have to take heed of. <coughs> what we're moving to, what we're trying to move to, is rather than just observing things and measuring things, is ultimately to be able to predict, to simulate what happens. Doing things in cities involves real people and is really hard. If we get enough data, we can start to think about building things like digital twins, a virtual model of the city, in which we can start to try out experiments before we spend millions of pounds investing in infrastructure. In order to do that, you need enormous amounts of data. And you need to then understand those systems. And we're a very long way off a digital twin of a city. But that's the direction of travel. And that would be an immense tool in terms of planning, in terms of understanding the impacts of decisions we make before we make them. <coughs> and the danger is around cities. As we started the talk, there were seven or eight cities. In fact, all of the cities across the UK are investing in smart. And the danger is Instead of a smart city system, we have 327 individual smart city systems, none of whom can talk to each other. And how do we learn what works and what doesn't if we have all of these individual systems? So Newcastle leads a consortium of six cities who are six and growing that is trying to build systems where we think about data in the same way. So I can access Sheffield or Manchester or Birmingham's data in the same way I can access Newcastle. So I can learn about what they've done and understand and learn from their mistakes and their successes. <coughs> Ultimately, all this is about is providing evidence about the human impact and the choices, the hard choices we have to make through data. So this is um, last year's, not just one gone, the one before, uh, bonfire night. And this is uh, PM 2.5 from a network of about 120 sensors. PM 2.5 is, is very, very small dust particles. And has, is particularly, there's quite a lot of recent research about it has many different uh, qualities um, in terms of impact human health in uh, lots of nasty ways. And you can see, this is bonfire night, and as, as people started lighting their bonfire then, and setting off their fireworks, the readings go through the roof. The blue line there is DEFRA's annual average uh, uh, requirements for uh, PM2.5. All the decisions we make, all of those decisions we make around cities and investment, all of them are choices. And we need to make hard choices moving forward to tackle things like climate change, like air quality, like inequality, like carbon net zero. And one of the ways we can empower ourselves to make those decisions and empower the people who govern us to make those decisions is to give them evidence and data to understand the impacts of their decisions. <coughs> Now, if you walked up Northumberland Street earlier today to get here, you may well have seen this. I, I took this earlier today. Um, and what you see there on the, on the lamppost there is one of our sensors. Uh, as you wander around Newcastle, you'll do what I do, get a bit of crick in your neck looking at sensors that are scattered around, often on lampposts, uh, very valuable real estate lampposts. And it's just a, an illustration of all the decisions we make have an impact. And we need to understand those impacts, both the ones we want and the ones we don't want, to make good decisions in city. So as part of the Christmas uh, market celebrations, uh, Blackett Street is closed, which you would think, that's a great thing. That's going to really improve air quality. No buses driving past there, much less traffic. And yes, 
We can see, if you follow the pink line, so this is uh, Saturday and Sunday as we move along here. So this is a week's data from that sensor. Saturday and Sunday, you can see the pink line does come down quite a lot. So we've reduced NO2. Unfortunately, burning all of those sausages produces quite a lot of PM2.5. So the trade-off here is, is buses or sausages, one of those two. All of those decisions have an impact. <coughs> so what's the glittering prize from all this? Where do we want to go? What could a smart city look like? Well, a smart city for me is one that uses data to learn from its mistakes, that has the capability, has the will, both social and through its regulators, to make hard decisions. And in order to do that, we have to understand this complex interplay of many systems and how they interact in our cities, both with the people, the infrastructure, the economics, all of these systems playing together. <coughs> That's the sort of city I'd like to live in. One that we learn from our mistakes, one that we adapt, and the one where we use data to understand how that city changes over time. Because the decision that's right today may not be right in two or three years' time. So we need to constantly be re-evaluating those decisions and not be afraid to go back and change it. That's what I call a smart city, and that's where I'd like to live. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone will agree that was a particularly thought-provoking talk, uh, and perhaps everyone will be uh, looking up at that post on the way home, uh, or indeed not walking down Northumberland Street ever again. Um, we have time for uh, hopefully quite a few questions. Um, I would also like to mention that if, if people do want to continue the conversation later, um, do feel free to, to go on Twitter if you are that way inclined. Um, there is Insights NCL on Twitter, um, and also the Urban Observatory is on Twitter as well. Do we have any questions? And there a couple of microphones. This gentleman here. Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Um, question. You mentioned that Bristol has um, an open uh, source data system. You also mentioned that nobody nationally or internationally has concentrated on any single system. You mentioned 54 different systems. Is this someone looking to? making proprietary technology and extracting value from it, or is there another willingness to share the knowledge? Um, I, think I, mean, I think that's one of the big dangers because the people who are interested in this space are exactly that. They want to sell us things. They want to sell cities systems. They want to sell uh, systems where they own the data. And it's exactly that in many of these places, and they become huge barriers in the end because we end up with systems that don't talk to each other. And if we can't extract value from systems through data by enabling them to talk to each other, then we get nowhere. I think one of, our, one of the greatest things we've achieved here in Newcastle is a, is a really simple thing, is a understanding with the city council and others that when they procure systems, they talk to us to ensure that the data coming out of those systems can be provided to researchers and the community through the platform that we've developed to avoid that tie-in where the company owns not just 
the system, but also the data that that system is producing. So I think your point is, is, is very apt. It is about proprietary systems and trying to avoid as much as possible data buying. Who is setting the priorities in Newcastle about what is collected and what is put out? For example, you've got all this investment, but you haven't got real-time timetables on the bus stops. Yeah. That's true. There are new bus stops coming with real-time timetables. And they have connectivity through to the platform so that we can, we can get those. Um, well, we're a research project working in partnership, so the way we set priorities is twofold. One of which is answering interesting questions about science, because actually the smart city thing is definitely not a done deal from a research. How many sensors do you need to answer particular types of questions? What density, what types of measurements do you do? So there's lots of research questions around data itself. There's also research questions around the technology. Some of the technology is, is very much in that developmental phase and still suffers from many problems. But of course, there's no point just doing research. We have to answer specific challenges. So we work with uh, the local authority, both Newcastle, Gateshead, and North Tyneside, and many others, including in the NHS, thinking about what are the problems we could try and solve with data. And we try and answer their problems or provide data to help them answer those problems. And sometimes the data is very useful, and that's great. And sometimes the data doesn't help them at all. And that's also really interesting from a research perspective because it tells us we're measuring the wrong thing, or we're measuring in the wrong place, or we're measuring the wrong variable. So it's really a balance of what I call discovery-led challenges around science, and then specific societal challenges is how we set the priority. And of course, we don't control what happens in the city. So in terms of experiments, we talk and we understand what's going to happen. So we have a lot of sensing around the clean air zone and what's going to happen there. We have sensing at different scales around the Haymarket Junction, which is currently going through a, a slow redesign. The same goes for Central Station and how the traffic's moving and how that's changing in terms of flows of people. So it's a mixture of those two things that sets our priorities. And who pays us? Mm. By paying, I don't mean commercial people, we're a research organisation, so we, we have to bid in a competitive market for research <laughs> projects against those challenges. And some we win and some we lose. We don't have a carte blanche to do everything. It all has to be funded through research activity. Yeah, this lady at the front. Well, I don't, I don't own most of that equipment. I only own two bits of, when I say own, oh, the university owns that equipment. The, the university paid for it out of, a, out of a research grant. So I suppose, technically, the taxpayer owns it. So thank you very much. So I only own two bits of that equipment. So I don't know why people are looking at it. I think it's an interesting question about interdependency. If we become to rely on data even more, then those things like the two monsoon, when we lose our power, we also lose our data. And then if we're operationalizing and managing systems through that data, that becomes uh, a, really, a really thorny problem. So side by side with things like uh, observations and monitoring, you also have to think about 
the strength of our infrastructure and how we keep that safe, given that we're facing these challenges around climate change ever increasing. So it's absolutely a, a very pertinent question, and I don't have an answer in terms of are we going to be more interdependent. We may well less be less less secure because we have this reliance on data unless we're very careful about how we build those systems and the, and the safeguarding we put in there. Yeah. I understand the point of collecting data where the environment is concerned or traffic or you know, all kinds of practical reasons. I'm a little bit confused by the data you showed live stream from one of the buildings. What on earth are you learning and why? That's a really good question. So are there any architects in the room? Oh no, oh, oh there's, there is one, oh good. Um, I'm gonna slag off architects now, not, not, not for any particular reason. But I think it's pretty typical of how we build systems. An architect, and I, my, my knowledge of architecture comes from sitting in a load of meetings with architects, by the way. I'm no expert, but what seems to happen in my in my uh, experience is an architect comes along with a great idea with lots of great reasons to, to, to build something in a certain way. And they, they design a beautiful building that is going to perform like this and it's going to be a great space. And actually, when that building's built, there'll be some problems with it and they may get, you might have had your own snag list when you've, had a build, when you've had a builder in and he's come back and fixed it or they've come back and fixed those problems. And we have those things when we build whole buildings or whole regions. What we don't actually do is ever think about how has that building performed over the long term? How did it perform a year after we built it in terms of the energy systems, did they work as they were supposed to? Well, that's a very mechanical view of the system. But what about the people flows through the building? Do the people use the building the way the architects thought they might? And I think the reason why we capture that sort of data is to try and answer those sorts of problems. To actually learn through data about how a building's being used, how it performs. Does the heating system perform correctly. The way we're actually using that data as well is we, if we collect data at that scale, we often find out something's broken quite a long way down the line. And then we have this ability to play back the building digitally. So we can go back six months and say, what was the building doing at that precise moment? And actually spot where that problem occurred and we have a better chance of finding a solution. So I think there are analogies about the building that we, can, that we can apply to the city. It's that idea that collecting that data enables us to learn from that data. Increasingly, there's some really interesting things going on at the moment around that idea that we all sit in this building. We have an assumption, for instance, that this building inside has cleaner air than outside. We know from measurements that, so you're all going to start coughing now. And so we know from measurements in certain buildings across the university, the air quality is sometimes worse inside than it is outside. It's got nowhere to go. And you've got lots of things that can generate things like dust, cushions on chairs, people moving in and about. So actually, in order to understand systems at the whole, you have to understand them at different scales as well. So we tie in building data, what's happening inside, and also what's happening outside. So for things like air quality, while we're un trying to understand exposure, it's not just about being outside, it's what we're exposed to inside. So I think there's really valid reasons for trying to collect that level of information. Yeah, a gentleman on the far side, uh, and then Oliver, I recognise. It was immensely interesting. 
I'm wondering what is the world's most smartest city uh, that you've come across? Well, that's Newcastle, obviously. <laughs> second, second to Newcastle. Second to Newcastle. Well, I, we started on this journey because we, when we actually started thinking about it, we went and looked and we went, where's all the data? All these smart cities, where's all the data? Where, why can't I see it? Why can't I see it? And a lot of smart is about projects that happen in small areas over a small amount of time. They don't have longevity, they don't go on for years, and they don't happen across the whole city, they happen in one little area. So actually there's a load of smart things going on, but they're not going on at scale. And that's a fudge, because I don't know what the next smartest city is. There's, all of these cities are doing really interesting things, don't get me wrong, we're just doing it bigger and better. <laughs> Thank you, Phil, uh, for a very excellent talk. I wonder, you, you, you talk about data and it's linked to the question earlier raised of why you measure all of this. And uh, obviously I see the point because we're trying to provide the evidence in order to make informed decisions. But can you give us an example where you think that you have collected lots of data and then the decision was completely ignoring your data set, which was then a stupid decision? Absolutely. And it's called the congestion charge in Newcastle. We're moved, we're, we're, we are being forced, as are all cities, based on measurements that come from modelling of traffic, um, which we know is poor. And the decision, the, the policy for Newcastle for years has been around exposure. And the exposure, we can measure that the high polluted areas are the Tyne Bridge, Central Motorway, Coast Roads, the major arteries. And that's been a conscious decision to push traffic onto there. A, it moves quickly. B, no one lives by the side of it. It's very close. NO2 and other things, they disperse quite quickly. So, you know, 50, 100 metres away from a road, levels are reasonably, usually back to sort of background level. So we are being forced by law, by the government, to make a decision and implement something. And I don't disagree with reducing, uh, improving air quality. Absolutely, we should improve air quality, but we're being forced to make the wrong decision. So we're going to improve NO2, and we may well improve it on the coast road, the Tyne Bridge, and Central Motorway. And we'll move it somewhere else. So we'll move, we're making the wrong decision, being forced to make the wrong decision. The data is absolutely clear about where those problems are and what we hope to see afterwards is that we might fix NO2 but we're still going to have a PM 2.5 problem. We're going to move the problem elsewhere because people will change their behaviour and they may well start to do rat runs and other things across streets that aren't designed to take high volumes of traffic so we have lots of queuing traffic. So I think that's a, a prime example where data hasn't been used to make a decision. And that's no fault of Newcastle's. We are forced by these blunt instruments that are currently used to enforce air quality standards to make what may well be a poor decision in the long term. Uh, there was a, a question from the gentleman just across the alley and then one in the middle. I just wonder whether you publish any evidence of decisions that are not very smart, uh, particularly in relation to things like inequalities which are happening uh, across the city and across the northeast. Um, it's hard to think of, a, of a, a really good example, and I think part of that problem is one of the things that we have to do in order to understand subtle signals in the city, particularly signals that have very long wavelengths and happen over a long period of time, is we have to collect an enormous amount of data. So some of those questions I hope we can answer when we have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen years of data. But I think those sorts of questions, those subtle things that are happening in the city through data are hard to, hard to pull out at the moment. Um, 
So you mentioned that uh, Newcastle's number one small city in the world. Uh, sorry, not the world, just number one small city. Um, how do you raise awareness of this or even promote and market this to let more people know about it? Um, I have no idea. I think it's something we do. We don't do very much out in Newcastle. We don't shout enough. We don't shout enough about what the great things that are going on here. Um, we're a long way from. We're a long way from London. But the eyes of some of these people are turning to us because of the of the partnerships we've created across the city. Because of the the, the technology that we're bringing to bear. We're opening or just about to open the National Innovation Centre for Data here on the on the. Helix campus. There is this, there is this growing digital and data hub that's coming out in Newcastle. But you're absolutely right. We don't do enough shouting about it. We are trying to shout about it. So there's a team from the university and the city council currently at the Smart Cities Expo in Barcelona, uh, and they have a, a, a stand there about Newcastle, and that is all about bringing in inward investment into Newcastle around digital, around data, and around smart. So get tweeting. Tell the world. Are there any, any further questions? Everyone, everyone in front of me in this line. Um. If Newcastle is so smart, um, why is traffic flow through the city so terrible? Um, you don't have to be that smart to look at it and think that it's actually a good one. Um, well, the reason why traffic is, uh, traffic is terrible is because uh, traffic fills to capacity. If we build more capacity, more traffic comes. You only have to look at the A1, and uh, we, we turned it from two lanes to three lanes to increase flow, and it did increase flow for quite a while, and, and now it's back to its uh, normal car park status uh, as those three lanes is filled. And as studies across the world show that if you increase tr uh, capacity for cars, cars will fill that capacity. So it's about making new and different decisions that are quite hard. Because actually, the, the car driving lobby is one of the most vociferous out there. And they don't want to impinge on their own personal freedoms. And I think it's through data that we empower decision makers. We empower people to back decision makers about making some hard decisions around things like uh, transport capacity and where we invest in infrastructure. There's a problem in economic uh, modelling called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And what that refers to is the fact that people can gather data and they really like the data they can gather, but it's not good enough to produce what is needed. You're showing what's the data on the environment here on PM 2.5. The research on health is showing 2.5, uh, 0.7, 0.10, 0.5, and trying to link it to different kind of disease states. Is any attempt being made to link what you're producing in the short term to different kinds of disease presentations? I mean, I think that's the, that's the if you like, going back to the question of value, how, do you, how, do you, how, how might you value a monitoring and observation network? And one of the ways you understand that value is if we can reduce NHS admissions for people presenting with certain types of diseases, then we could quickly save enough money on the NHS to fund observation networks bigger than you can ever imagine. So the value of these types of things is in trying to answer those sorts of questions. <coughs> that is exactly the type of questions we are currently investigating. So tying these into public health outcomes, tying these into hospital visits, trying to understand that complex interplay. We certainly don't have the answers yet, but we're starting on that road. And these types of data enable us to do that for the sort of first time. 
maybe just the, the one final question, if that's okay. Oh. Okay. As we become more dependent on these data systems, are we becoming dependent on satellites? And, and what, you know, what is the financial uh, burden on the UK for our own satellites? And is it part of your business? I, I would love to say I, I had enough money to buy some satellites. Uh, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's, that's beyond, beyond my remit. Um, we do use one of the interesting data sets that I haven't shown here today is, you know, we've been focusing on what we call point measurements largely and, and things that are on the ground pointing at. Actually, a lot of answers we can get by using data from satellites. We don't necessarily have to put them up themselves because there are hundreds of satellites out there producing information. Uh, we call it remote sensing. So these sensors are pointing back. What we get is a different type of information. We get information that covers a very large area, so it might cover the whole of Newcastle, but we only get it once or twice a day as the satellite goes over. But certainly in terms of things like air quality, urban heat island, and those sorts of measures, we can integrate measures from space through remote sensing with ground measurements. And one of the sort of active areas of interest and research is how we tie those two together. Because they measure things in slightly different ways and slightly different scales. And actually understanding how those two link together is quite an interesting scientific question. So I don't know whether I've fully answered your question because I don't pay for any satellites, but that type of data is very critical at different scales. Okay, uh, and the final question, the gentleman there. Uh, hi. Um... I've been following what's been happening in China. I'm interested in when you were talking about which cities are smart cities. China seems to be uh, going, leap, going forward in leaps and bounds in this area. I mean, my concern is that we may be building the foundations here to a dystopian future. In China, they're building a system of social credits where every citizen has a credit score, uh, a bit like our financial credit scores, but for their um, social worthiness, which gives them access to all sorts of public sector goods and services. And um, when you combine this with facial recognition, is that the kind of future we're heading for in the UK? Um, I would certainly hope not. And I think, but as, I, as I've raised here, those are legitimate concerns about data. And they're legitimate concerns about governance and ownership. Who owns those? In China, it might be the state. In, the, in, in Canada, it might be Google. And here it might be, if we're, if we're very unlucky, Amazon or Facebook, if we're not careful. So I think we, as citizens, ought to be aware of, of those issues. Technology itself, of course, is neither good nor bad, but nor is it neutral. So I think you have to be an aware citizen and be informed about what the potential of this is, because I think it has enormous potential for good, for evidence-based decision-making, for understanding what we do and how it affects us. But it also has, as you rightly point out, dangers associated with it. Regardless of whether we're doing it or not, everybody's doing this. It's an almost unstoppable drive around data and monitoring and observation. Thank you very much.